not so sure if reaching a milestone is something we necessarily look forward to sometimes, mainly because we look at it and go, wow, was it really that long ago? We're about to find out from Matt Taylor whether he feels that way about Chain. Because Oz Blues band Chain reached a milestone in 2019, it's been 51 years since they first formed in 1968. For how many people it's pretty scary to stop and think 1968 was 51 years ago? And Matt Taylor joins us on the program right now. Hi, Matt. How are you, Chris? Very well. Thanks very much for having a chat to us. Nice for you to join us. This story of chain goes back to 1968. Yeah. Something tells me you're sitting there right now thinking about it because we're having a conversation, yeah. and it seems like yesterday. It does, especially in the last 20 years. They've just gone so quickly. All of a sudden, you know, friends who had little children, they're married with six kids. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just whizzes past. All those, uh, you know, people who are 20 and 25 enjoy it. It goes pretty quick. How do you keep it up for this length of time? There are many people who do various jobs, especially jobs that I think are physically demanding. And it's very easy to forget that playing music and performing on stage and all that sort of stuff is indeed quite demanding physically. How do you keep it up all these years and how are you still able to do it? I think because you took it up because of the absolute love of music, which has always been the driving force with me, just the love of playing. I tell people, uh, when I uh, first started playing, it was the 14th of February 1966 was the first gig I ever did. First gig I you went... ever paid decimal currency for too. That's why I remember it. <laughs> I was never paid in pounds. I was always paid in dollars. You did that gig, and I, I went home, and I had an old scrapbook, and it had about 24 pages. So I went about 12 pages in, and I put a little asterisk. And I thought, if I can fill that up, I've done pretty well. Here I am, 50-odd <laughs> years later, and still playing music. If anyone would have told that 17-year-old that he'd be uh, playing in the year 2019, I would have just laughed at them. Actually, bearing in mind the way rock and rollers used to live their life in 1966, if somebody told you you'd still be alive in 2019, you might have been quite impressed. I think I would have been. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a drive to become a musician, or did it just kind of happen because you got out there, you played music, and you became successful at it? The funny thing was, I was the only non-musical one in my family. I came from, my parents used to entertain the troops during World War II, singing concert parties, and they'd sit around the piano. I'd be in the backyard playing with guns and doing all silly things. Then I heard the Beatles, and within two years, I'm a professional musician. I'd been taking in all that music I'd heard all my life, not knowing that I was taking it in. Do you think, though, the Beatles were a bit of a revolution for you? Oh, it just changed my life. What sort of and records, apart from the Beatles, let's use 15 or 16 as a benchmark, if you don't mind. Yeah. If we had a look, and it would have been your 45 collection, whatever you could afford to buy, I guess. What sort of artists would we have found? And I think in the Rolling Stones and people like that, did they figure in your music taste? I probably was only a raging Beatles fan for about less than a year. And I still love the Beatles to this day, but uh, when I heard the Rolling Stones, a uh, penny just dropped, and I thought, oh, wow, where's this music been all my life? And the first album I bought was Please Please Me by the Beatles, and then I bought the Rolling Stones album, and within a few months of buying the uh, Rolling Stones album, I was buying Muddy Waters and... Slim Harpo, Bo Diddley, <laughs> you know, it just released something in me. And to this day, I uh, still listen to people like that when I get the chance. Quite amazing. You've got a new song at the moment called Northern Sun. Could we say that any of those bands from all those years ago still had an influence or have you completely revised what you do for modern times? When I started off playing, I was a, a blues copyist. And I still tell people, if you're going to be a professional musician, for the first two years of your life, copy everything, everything that you can lay your hands on, and then for the rest of your life, try to forget it and bring yourself in. Because you must copy to get techniques. And once you've got those techniques, you start to develop them for yourself. The music I play now, like Chain, I call Oz Blues, which is Australian blues, 
And Oz Blues has even transformed into what I played now, and I call it Oz Indigo. It's a completely different way of playing the blues. It doesn't sound like the blues, but it actually is. So it's been a progression right from that 14th of February 1966. Let's have a listen to Northern Sun and you can work it out for yourself. <laughs>
That's the latest song from Shane. It's called Northern Sun. Shane, by the way, are 51 years young. Shane reached a milestone this year, celebrating 51 years since they first formed in 1968. Yes, I do have to tell you, 1968 was 51 years ago. In the meantime, Matt Taylor is still banging out some great music and he joins us on the program. You've got some gigs coming up real soon. Where can we see Chain playing after 51 years? We're going down to Pinjarra on the 1st of June. So on the 31st of May, we're going to do the Charles Hotel. Uh, and that'll be the first time Chain's played in Perth for probably well over two years at the Charles Hotel. So really looking forward to that. And something else I have to ask you, I know, welcome to the modern times. You do have a website? Yep. Yeah. There's quite a few chain websites. There's a Matt Taylor website, and it's on that. There's quite a few people in the public have chain websites. I think Phil's got a chain website. We're pretty well represented out there. You remain, and this is something that chain has. You have to be pretty proud of this record. You are still the only blues band in the world to have a number one on the Australian charts. That was Black and Blue. We're going to play that song in a while too, as well as a number two, and that was Judgment. You as a solo artist, we sit back and think about your version of I Remember When I Was Young. I suppose that song now is actually singing to yourself, really, isn't it? It's incredible. I was 23 when I wrote I Remember When I Was Young. 23. <laughs> <laughs> it's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, and you look at it now and think, gee, that song was never more relevant than it is now. It's a funny thing, but when I recorded it, my mother, she said, Matt, that song will never be forgotten because it's relevant at any age. Yes. And yeah. I thought, yeah, Mum, yeah, you probably got something there. And uh, my mum's proved to be right. Yeah, the wisdom of your mum. Who would have oh, known yeah. about that? Something about Chain at the time you were recording and the band was hitting the charts and you're on the yep. Australian music scene, you really stuck out because it's perhaps not unfair to suggest there weren't too many acts anywhere in the world like you, were there? No. I think we changed the direction of Australian music. It was just pure pop before Chain came along. And I can remember going to a radio station in 1970 and I leant over and shook the DJ's hand and I said, thank you, thanks very much for playing Black and Blue. And he looked at me and he said, I wouldn't play this, it's just that it's number one and I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what's the number one reason that you have to understand that you do things in this business? It's because people want to hear it, not necessarily because you do. Yeah, and he was so used to playing three-minute and two-and-a-half-minute poppy songs, which is absolutely lovely, but I'm a musician and music's so important to me, I don't waste it. I think the thing that people forget is there was a very, very good reason why the song was number one, and that is regardless of what anyone individually thinks of it, it was a good song and people collectively liked it. Oh yeah, it was just amazing. I'll tell you an incredible story about it. I was in a band called Genesis a long time before that other Genesis pinched the name and I had a great guitarist, he left, and I'd heard Chain had broken up in Brisbane, so I sent a telegram to Phil. A couple of days later, I get a letter, remember telegrams and letters, it said, Matt, Chain hasn't broken up, why don't you come up and join Chain? So I go up and join Chain, at the very first rehearsal, we go through every song, it's a Wednesday, we have to play Friday night, so we go through every song that we know together, and right at the end of the night, Phil is sitting on his amp and he starts playing dum da 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 And I said, Phil, that riff's incredible. What is it? He says, it's just something I'm mucking around with. And I said, guys, make a cup of tea. I'm going to sit over there, write out a whole pile of heavy words and we're going to do a work song. And that's the first rehearsal of Chain, the day I joined, that's where Black and Blue comes from. It's been a pleasure having you on the program, Matt. Let's have a listen to that old Australian number one classic, Black and Blue. <laughs> Great. Bro. Wait, 
Big finish. 